Barry Joe Stull, Sunday, May 17th, 11, 19 p.m. Uh, Barry Joe, you had something to say. What was that? First thing is we have to make sure that people understand that we're doing this low tech and we're getting this done because we have some important things to say. And I'm hoping that Mary is holding the speaker close to the microphone and she's got that stuff going on and that uh, they're aware of that. And uh, it's not how far away you are from me, it's how far away you are from the speaker and the thing that you're dealing with over there. So I'm going to be here doing my thing, and here we go. We were talking about appliances that work with the human body. Oh no, oh no, we're putting this on tape. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Do you mean like tubes of lipstick, Barry Joe Stahl? <laughs> Sorry, what were you talking about, Mary? I was gonna start that. Uh, I was gonna start. No, it's all you. The, Leia. I was gonna start a presentation here. And I, I, I don't know why you're giving me the heckling because I haven't even started yet. Okay, Barry, I'm putting on green lipstick. Okay, I hope we get more than ten views. <laughs> okay, Jack Hair had a recipe for a stuffed chicken breast. And one of the qualities that Jack Hare exploited was a Thompson seedless grape. And when the Thompson seedless grape was added to the stuffing in that stuffed chicken breast, it made a thing that Jack then sold and got royalties for for the rest of his life. Did you hear that, Mary Ann? Yes, I, I'm patiently, uh, I'm sorry, yes. Very good, very good, Barry. Keep going. Okay, so when we talk about Jack Hare and we put it into Wikipedia, what we're going to give is we're going to strain a pot that was named after him, so mm -hmm. he would have naming rights, and he would be sponsored using his name, just like they paint Coca-Cola on the side of the race car. The race car isn't made by Coca-Cola. It doesn't haul Coca-Cola. It goes around the track because it's a thing. Well, Jack Hare did that to have people pay him, so he had a bounty. So if you were trying to prove that Jack Hare was a liar, you couldn't because they had a $100,000 bounty if you proved him wrong, and nobody could ever claim it. Yeah. And for uh, yeah. clarification, Jack Hare is a big-time cannabis dude. Maybe not as big as somebody else, but he was maybe an over overhyped big cannabis dude. No, he's, he's really important. He's not. He's not. So we need to go. There's a strain named after him. Yeah, but we need to go edit his Wikipedia because Barry Joe wants to like correct the record. He's the one. He's the one person. Yeah. Okay. Emperor of hemp right, is what he's now, called. Now here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking, this overarching theme here is about information and knowledge and, and how we communicate. And I told you from the go before we recorded. And I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little too. Feel excited about this. Well, I really need to do this from not a challenging thing that Mary puts me through that makes me speak with this tone of voice when I should be talking to Brandon, my friend. Brandon, your friend. Yes, I'm, please. He's right here. I'm right here. I can hear it. <laughs> so you can hear the tone of voice so I can talk to Brandon because Brandon is receptive of everything I have to say. Here, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, you're introducing Brandon Farley. Hello. Here, scoot up, scoot up. So we're editing a Wikipedia article? Or yeah. It, the record... No, no. Yeah. No, no, no so what, we're doing, what we're doing right now is we're making a different video. Let's think about how hard it was to make the video that we're going to make. Because what we first have to do is we have to, ex we have to see, and, I, and I'm getting on my soapbox now, and that's why my voice is changing. You can see my body language with my voice. They don't see me sitting on my chair with a clenched fist right now. I don't know what else I could do. I'm trying to say that as a culture of eight billion, they're talking right now. I, I told Mary that this uh, COVID was going to take out a uh, billion, and we're, we're getting there. And we're doing stupid things. Uh, but anyhow, the thing is, we have about eight billion people in this culture of humanity. Without getting my fist in my own chair, while I'm talking to people that I respect and love, and we're, 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 we're
recipes for cat food, and then I'm going to be looking for recipes for cats. Hmm. And when I see recipes for cats, I'm going to be hoping that the gunshots I hear are people that are exploiting cats that they think are carrying the virus so they can eat them. So this, is, so, they can eat them. So, so this is about misinformation in the in the public media, in the press. It's about misinformation in the culture. Mm. Totally, the media is part of the communication. It's part of the culture. Culture is a word. It's in my uh, it's in my yogurt. It's why it is yogurt? Because the culture introduced there to change the milk into whatever those things are in there. There's a billion in there, man. There's a billion culture things in my refrigerator right now, man. I'm talking about culture. Okay. What happens when you put something in that something else does or something with that makes them do what they do? What happens when you get a bunch of people to rock concert? They're all it's on a like, rock concert. Do they call it cognitive like dissonance or something? What happens when you get them at a country uh, concert? They're on a country concert, right? It's a little different. Well, some guy's up, up in the uh, Las Vegas Hotel and he gets out of his bump, uh, stocks, and starts shooting everybody. Well, that's different. And what if you're in a mall and you hear about this shit and you're somebody from Occupy Portland and you're, and you're telling me in the park down here how, how you were there when it happened and you couldn't figure out what was going on and you were in the town and the police are all responding and you're trying to hide and the, and the bathroom to figure out what you're going to get me and what she was going to do. And I heard that story about how the gal who, you know, she did the uh, Occupy Poco. They pranked the police, man. They had stick horses. And they, they went out there and they got up with the horse cops. And it was, every horse, horse cop had a, had a stick horse cop. Except the horse cops were clown cops. There was a little keystone cop warning that there these people on these stick horses. And they're going along. And there's the big six foot tall uh, of a horse, a plow horse with a cop on it. And, and yeah, I'm walking next to it. And it's going clop, 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 clop. And next to it is the gal I'm talking to about. And she's on a stick horse. And behind her, like a Monty Python, the uh, uh, Holy Grail, there's a clown with coconut halves going clop, 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 clop. clop. Well, and he's dressed in full um, regalia. He looks like Bozo. He's got the yellow wig and a nose. <laughs> and he's an absolute clown clown. And his job is to go behind her and make the horse clock sound so she can be a stick horse being a keystone cop next to the real cop. And they took pictures of this. They put it on there in real time. They're like, holy shit, this woman is a genius. <laughs> She's not the only horse cop in the Occupy Popo. Every, every horse cop that the cops have has a stick horse cop. With a coconut clown. <laughs> What's a, a stick horse cop? What does that mean? You know, when you were a little kid and had a blue stick and had a horse oh, on it. Yeah, yeah, when you're riding the, the sticky pony. Yeah. Okay.
guy gets on the telephone and he hears the gunshot on the cop he's talking to or whatever, you know. These people are freaked, absolutely freaked out. And she told me the story about that's what she did and then, and then how it kind of unfolded and how she recovered from that. But we're down here May Day at the, at the park down here. The, the, uh, uh, and that's how I was talking about this was a, she was a, one of our culture. So it's one of our culture that I have to have the stick horse person. She's the, also the down in Las Vegas person who's also a prison employee going into prison and working in there, whatever she's doing. She's a preacher. Yeah, she, right. She's paying to go in there. She's still, you know, what I would call a prison employee because you know they're down in prison. Right, so anyhow, the thing is that the emotions that she was expressing about this event that I just keep happen on about it, people act differently in different situations and I said rock concerts and I said country music and I said want to shoot the people and I said well if you're in the town and she was in the town where the country music was getting shot up and she told me what, it, what her physical and the, the, the people around her and what happened where she was and I heard that same story not the same fact that that is setting Dif- different setting I know the West Side story and Romeo and Juliet are the same story uh huh Attacked because of wearing a hijab and her friend, young lady on the train. That oh, here we are back on this. They, 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 they didn't catch on what was going on until they caught on what was going on. And they freaked out that there is. I, I'm going to say that they, they're two of them. And the two words. That I used after that would freak out. Imagine you're in a situation where you realize you're on a train and people are getting killed. They freaked out. They were the they were the epitome of anybody on that train that freaked out. Now other people died, right? So yeah, there was shit going on. Other people, you know, couldn't say anything. You know, other people didn't do anything but walk away, right? These Two young women freaks out. The gal in Las Vegas story freaked out. Because people were freaking out. But this freak out on the Hollywood Max stop, because the train will stop when they got off. Just like it stopped when I got off. Every time I got off, it was just like they were getting off. They got off, they ran up the steps, she drops her bag in a panic. She runs up to the top of the steps with her friend. They go down the ramp. They go into the building that's there, which is a 24-hour fitness, to the bathroom stall. Can you be any more freaked out than that? Uh, no. I mean, that's pretty hysterical, I guess. The time they left the train, if I was them, and I ran as fast as I could to that bathroom stall, knowing where it was at, um, it would be more than a minute. It would be more than two minutes. It would be more than five minutes if I didn't know where I was going. Jeremy Christian had exited the train, picked up that backpack, went out threw it off the overpass when he went the opposite direction that they went. He threw it down onto the freeway, crossed the overpass, and then later was, you know, apprehended that's all the rest of the story. The point of what I shared both of those stories with is the human condition and panic. Jeremy Christian did not panic. walked up those stairs in a pace that was moderated, he grabbed the backpack, he knew what he was doing, he walked over, he threw it down onto the freeway. He did not run away. He did not run. I don't know if 
Christian story that he ran I don't, at all. I don't know. Yeah, he never ran. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think he ever ran. What's no, what? Run for why would uh what was the significance of the bag? What was in the bag? Why was he trying to hide it? I was trying to hide it. It was the girl's book bag. Oh, oh, the girl that was running to the yeah. They she dropped it. She dropped it because oh, okay. Well, here's what you don't know. When you shit your pants or somebody shits their pants or I pee my pants or something because I'm afraid, that's because I have triggered the limbic response. I'm in the fight or flight mode and I have to go tomorrow. I shut off my sexual reproduction because there's no tomorrow. I shut off my digestion because there's no tomorrow. I take all the stuff that's going to have to do with tomorrow and I put it into this second. So my body turns everything that can go. And if there's something that can fuel a muscle to make me stronger, if there's something that can make me smarter, and something that can get my brain going and make me able to think faster, and maybe able to have tunnel vision so I can focus on the threat, I can turn off everything I need to to get that. Whatever this tiger is going to eat me. What am I going to do? Am I going to jump away? Am I going to punch you? What am I going to do? That's a natural response that we have. It's called the fight or flight or freeze or faint. <laughs> we just call it fight or flight. Women are more likely to faint than men or are more likely to fight. And there's the four choices. And everyone has. And Jeremy Christian was was underwater with that. If there's a way to be underwater, we went each step, those people step. To the point where the expert witness to testify to preserve matters for the appellate record, where this could not be heard by the jury. But it could be heard by me because I was not the jury. And it was placed for the record, so there's a transcript of it. And it now says that at the time of the stabbing, Jeremy Christian was on autopilot. He couldn't have done anything else. He was not in control of the time. But, oh, by the time of... Huh. Here's my response to my friend Jeremy Christian's stabbing and my friend Michael Fletcher. Uh -huh. I know both of them. They both know me. I know she's not some fucking big deal. Who fucking cares? You know, a girl named Mary Ann just dropped the F-bomb on her own video. Well, okay. Yeah. So, so, so the point that I'm trying to make here, friends, and whoever, Jesus, is that the fight or flight response is something that's triggered by our emotions that are triggered by our information that is triggered by the environment that we're in which is triggered by the things that create the environment we are in. So a person in a loud environment with a lot of distractions at a rock concert, they hear a loud noise, yeah, it's a loud noise, they got a rock concert. You take that same sound, you have a person expecting it's going to be their PC, but I'm walking to turn that on, and they're going to freak out because they're going to do this to me. And they're going to trigger that fight or flight response. And that is going to make you lose the weight of the digestive content so you don't have that weight when you run away and that's why you poop your pants that's why we scare the shit out of you <laughs> so that person was scared shitless but <laughs> they scared all the shit out alright so that is the human condition and so here I am as a person and Going down the tunnel towards the light. Next thing you know, they grab me, hang me upside down, they put me on the scale, and sooner or later I'm on my other bosom. Because I was uh, breastfed. I'm circumcised and breastfed. So those are two uh, two interesting uh, qualities for a man in America. <laughs> but, uh, well, how do you check on this list, and how do you check on that list? Halfway natural. <laughs> yeah. And we can laugh about that. But I'll tell you, I gotta tell you this. 
uh, I just got a, a Facebook friend request from Kelly Page, who was the administrator of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. And we were at the state of Oregon office building, and we were on a satellite feed from a live conference in Iowa, so we were on their time zone when we got there in the morning early. And uh, we did the two-day conference, and between the first day and the second day, we got home and we find out uh, by a voicemail from my brother that my mother passed away. Uh, 